Hello, hello, this is John Mark W. hitting you with the word again. You guys know how it goes. There have been many lores, many stories, many movies and forms of entertainment that have awesome stories, some with great morals of their stories and morality coming right out of the Bible and what's right and what is not and that letting you know there is no substitute for right doing. Kind of just like the Bible does. And I really like those type of stories. Just to name a few, some would be like Lord of the Rings. Star Wars, George Lucas's Star Wars, um, uh, Charles Dickens, classic stories like uh, The Christmas Carol, uh, uh, you name it, the list goes on. Even Charlie Brown has, you know, uh, had some really cool things that hit home, you know, for people, you know, deep down inside that touches us all as human beings, you know what I mean? The Basically the core fundamental values that we all have and those things are from the Bible, and I believe that's what makes these things great. That's what makes these things, uh, you know, good stories. They make sense, and they're dealing with truths and principles that are built into creation. And there are other stories that it's morally gray. Uh, you can tell that whoever made this story, they have an atheistic mindset. There's really no moral to it. It's very, it's an immoral story and is told and, you know, there is no right or wrong. There is no moral in it. And it's, I, I really try to stay away from stuff like that because it, 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 all it does is make me angry because I look at it and I'm saying, ah, that's not how real life is. That, I don't think that would really happen. I know that wouldn't really happen. This is nonsense. And then there are some uh, things that are bleak and uh, just very, very dark uh <laughs> Fantasy worlds that are created by people who, I don't know, man. I don't know what they were smoking or what they were thinking. But anyway, the fact that I wanted to share that is because the Bible is actually true. Unlike those stories, which some are good and most are not, that are made in the secular world. So, and especially during this time of COVID-19 where people need encouragement, people need a ray of hope and light, and that hope can only come from Jesus Christ and His Word. He is the Word personified. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, everyone, every people group has a right to know this Word. Okay, when we talk about God and we talk about Jesus, we ain't talking about the white man's God. Okay. Okay, I talked in my other previous videos about the the lineage of the bloodline of where Jesus came from because he was born from Mary, so it was Mary's bloodline, and of course had the Holy Ghost DNA which came straight from God. Okay, unpolluted by sin. That's why he had to be the sinless sacrifice for us to get our sins forgiven. And Jesus was the only one who could accomplish this because of that. No one else could accomplish this. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Hari Hari Krishna, not um, um, not uh, Serapis Bay, the Lord of the Seven Rays, who is who you see in those pictures of Jesus with the long hair and the pasty white skin and uh, almost looks like he's wearing lipstick or something like that. That's who that is. That's Serapis Bay. That's not how Jesus Christ looked. And the Bible describes Jesus Christ as looking very different in his glorified body in heaven on the throne. In Revelations 1.15, you can read that for yourself. Um... And of course, when we come around to reading the book of Revelations, I'll talk more about that then. But anyway, that's my introduction. I'm so happy you guys joined. Please like and subscribe if these videos help you. I'm about to share something with you that will, is not really shared in too many places of scholarly uh, learning. And that is kind of sad. That's very sad. Um, scholarly learning and a lot of other forms of entertainment and media and many, many, many other avenues in this world are being... Uh, polluted by an atheistic worldview and a very sinful mindset and one that um, shakes its fist at God and, 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 and is just very, 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 um, you know, treating the things of God like unwanted property. And, of course, the Bible um, says that this is going to happen. So it makes sense. And if you're a Christian and you're if you're a Bible-believing Christian, uh, person who is a student of the Bible, like myself, or somebody who is a uh, really, really living out the biblical Christianity, you, you're not surprised, okay? You know this, the Bible told, tells us that this would happen, but the reason I'm sharing these videos is to, because of the, the raising 
the awareness of biblical literacy and how it can actually help you and your family and your life. It can change your life for the better. Not like the devil, which will change your life for the worst. And that means you doing your own thing or doing anything that God would not have you do. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to get into this. We're reading Genesis 28, okay, and this doesn't have a title. It's just Genesis 28, and it just gets right into the Word, and so it has other subtitles in different parts, but at the start of it, it doesn't have one, and so it's surprising to see that. So we're using the New Living Translation because, you know, it's, uh, you know, for some, the V's and thou's, they, they don't really, uh, you know, get down with that. I'm used to that, though. That's the first type of Bible that I read when I was a kid, but... Just for the sake of, you know, easy reading and easy listening, I just went on ahead and used a New Living Translation. My pastor uses this, so I'm going to go ahead and use this. So we're going to get started without further ado. So Genesis 28, chap uh, chapter 28, verse number 1. Let's do it. Oh, yes, and at the end of this video, there will be prayer for those people who need it, prayer for the sick, prayer for sinners, prayer for backsliders, and prayer for Christians if they need to be healed or get their hearts right with God for any reason. So let's go ahead and get down to this. So Isaac called for Jacob, blessed him, and said, You must not marry any of these Canaanite women. Instead, go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your grandfather Bethuel, and marry, and marry excuse me, one of your uncle Laban's daughters. May God Almighty bless you and give you many children, and may your descendants multiply and become many nations. May God pass on to you and your descendants the blessings he promised to Abraham. May you own this land where you are now living as a foreigner, for God gave this land to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to stay with his uncle Laban, his mother's brother, the son of Bethuel, and Ar Aramin. Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Badan Aram to find a wife and that he had warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. He also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents and gone to Badan Aram. It was now very clear to Esau that his father did not like the local Canaanite women. So Esau visited his uncle Ishmael's family and married one of Ishmael's daughters in addition to the wives he already had. His new wife's name was Mahalath. Uh, she was the sister of Nebaioth uh, and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. Uh, as he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They shall spread out in all directions to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you. Whenever you go, one day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he, rest, he had rested his head against, and he, said, he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place of worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. That is amazing. So many supernatural and spiritual principles 
end this chapter. So we're going to go ahead and get into the nitty gritty of it. And this is a very short chapter, which is really cool. Um, I'm hoping this video will not go over 20 minutes. Let's see if I can do it. OK, <laughs> so let's go ahead and get into the analysis portion. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and said, you must not marry any of these Canaanite women. Now, we all know that because Isaac and Rebecca, OK, the mother of Jacob and Esau, didn't like them. Now, I guess. Um, yeah. So. So, yeah, that's why he says, do you know, don't do that. You're going to marry, you know. So he repeated what his father did for him, went back to his his went back to Laban's place. OK. Instead, go at once to Badan Aram, to the house of your grandfather, Bethuel, and marry one of your uncle Laban's daughters. May God Almighty bless you and give you many children, and may your descendants multiply and become many nations. Okay, he's basically telling him what God has told uh, Isaac, and God told Abraham. So he's also telling Jacob that. Okay, may God pass on to you and your descendants the blessings he promised to Abraham and may you own this land where you are now living as a foreigner for God gave this land to Abraham so Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padan Aram to stay with his uncle Laban his mother's brother the son of Bethuel the Aramean Esau knew that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to find a wife and that he had warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. So he also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents and gone to Badanaram. So, you know, it was now very clear to Esau, finally, I guess he finally realized that his, <laughs> you know, his mother and father didn't like these women and that they weren't the role model of women that you would marry. But, you know, Esau likes what he likes and he, he wants to get it. So he got it. And so he got two of them. And so... Yeah, so he finally realizes that, that his father didn't like the local Canaanite woman, so Esau visited his uncle Ishmael's family and married one of Ishmael's daughters in addition to the wives he already had. So he says, well, if Jacob's going to go over to Padanaram and marry Laban's, shoot, I'm going to go over to, you know, my dad, my uncle Ishmael's house, you know, and I, and I want, I want one, of, one, of, one of his daughters that he got then, so I'll do this. So since he's doing that, I'm, I'm going to go this way. You know what I'm saying? And uh, his new wife's name was Ma Mahalath, and she was the sister of Neboeth and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, or oldest son, or half-son, if you want to get technical. But notice the Bible doesn't say half-son, because he comes from Abraham, so he's also blessed in his own way, and yes. Um... So let's go ahead. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran and shut down. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. How many know we all need to get some sleep sometime? As he slept, he dreamt of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. Okay, pause. If you guys ever heard that saying of Jacob's ladder, if you guys ever heard of that saying, or uh, th this is basically what they're getting it from. Now, technically, it wasn't Jacob's ladder. Jacob saw this, and God allowed him to see this. So technically, it's the Lord God Jesus Christ's ladder, and you know this was a very special place. That's why God allowed Jacob. To see this thing okay and so yes at the top of the stairway stood the Lord and he said I am the Lord the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac the ground you are lying on belongs to you I am giving it to you and your descendants your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth they sh they will spread out in all directions to the west to to west and the east to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am giving you, I am giving, I am with you, and will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. So this was a promise that he was giving Jacob. Okay, he's giving it and he said it to Abraham. Many times he had to remind Abraham, and it would make sense because Abraham, uh, you know, obviously had longer life than Isaac, 
and who I think he's he may have a longer life even than Jacob too. You know, it was a different time, and people were living. You know, as time progresses, people you know live. You know, they they they, they uh, live uh, shorter. You know, because of what God said after the flood. Now many people are just living sinful, terrible lives, and so he's like, man, you know. Uh, men, uh, we, we, we ain't going to let them live past about 120 years old. That's about the max that I want to see this because they're thinking nothing about but sinful things, you know, continually. And, and this is just terrible. Imagine 800, 500, 900 years of men thinking to do sinful things. I mean, geez, you know, that's just crazy. So, um, anywho, back to this. And God has said this to Abraham. He had to remind him many times. He's even reminded Isaac on two or three occasions in the word. And then now he's telling Jacob straight up this. He's telling it straight up from God to Jacob. So Jacob isn't hearing this from his father, okay, or his mother, you know, in the little stories that they probably were telling him to encourage them as children. He's actually getting it from the Lord God himself at this time where he's viewing this ladder and all the angels ascending and descending upon this ladder. So this has some significance, okay? When angels come down to earth, they are doing God's, what God tells them to do. They are literally messengers of God and they're handling and they're assigned to people. You know what I'm saying? You know, we have angels assigned to us and they are um, tasked right with with doing things and uh you know especially after you're christian i whether an angel is assigned to you before you become a christian i don't really know that and uh, i don't even know the odds and ends about angels and their assignments i just know that angels are usually you know they come to do what god tells them to do and they do their mission and then they report back. They go back to heaven. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a way to look at it. It's a way that we humans can understand it, but it's probably way more different than even that. We really, you know, we know something is going on and we know God is involved with the lives of men and women everywhere on the earth more than people give him credit for. And um, this is just showing a glimpse of that. Okay. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. See, this is possible to happen. The Lord could be in a place, and we may not even be aware of it until he has already left. You know what I'm saying? This, this is a possibility of happening. We feel the presence of God. We feel something, and we're like, what is that? And we realize, oh my goodness, that was the presence of God. If you're sensitive to that thing, if you are a person with no faith, I don't know, you might rationalize and say it's something else and might not even think to add God to the equation because you just don't believe that. But you'd be missing out on something very important when you do that. But he was also very afraid and said, this is an awesome place this is. What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God and the very gateway to heaven. So let's pause again. Look at this. So where there is a connection between heaven and earth is going to be places where God comes down. Where are places where God and the spirit of God comes down? His house. Where is his house? His house is the church. The church that has people who are sold out and are sold out in believing on him. Where is his where can his church be? The Bible said where two or more are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. So think about that. Think about that. Jacob is by himself. Now there had to be other angels there, I believe, not only because that looks cool and they're doing their assignments, but there had to be some other beings there because Jacob is by himself. And the Bible clearly says, where two or more are gathered, I am in the midst. So Jacob was witnessing the other angels. The other angels were probably seeing, knew that Jacob was there. And then the Lord was at the top of the ladder speaking to Jacob in the presence of the angels. So you had at least three, excuse me, you had at least three entities there. Jacob, the angels, and Jesus, God himself the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings. So this is an awesome thing. Everything was there. It was bearing witness with each other. So technically, a person can be by themselves 
and have church. Because they're, if they're really having church, they're going to have Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit with them. And that's three right there. So add the uh, group of angels for, 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 for some variety, and you got four entities. And if you want to get technical, however many angels he saw, that's technically how many people that were there. So you had God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and however many angels you can count, plus Jacob. So it could have been anywhere from, you know, how many people there. The fact of the matter is, there's more than two or three gathered here. Je Jesus is in the mix. He's speaking to Jacob as a pastor or a man of God would hear from the Lord. He is getting greatly encouraged, and this gives him focus, drive, encouragement, and a purpose to do what he needs to do for the Lord, for the people, delivering God's message to them, and doing what's right. It's awesome. And where this takes place is the church. And where can the church be? Where two or three or more are gathered, Jesus said he is in the midst. We're going to read that later on in the New Testament. So that's a cross reference to that. I can't think of the verse and the scripture, but if y'all know the Bible, y'all know what I'm talking about. So this is an awesome revelation right here that Jacob is receiving. And Abraham received this by faith when he would set up little altars to the Lord and worship there. Remember? Isaac, he set up his altars to the Lord and he worshiped where in places where he was at too. And we see Jacob is continuing this tradition. And this isn't one of those silly traditions where, you know, it's just a mere religious tradition where you have people doing it because their dad did it and because my dad did it, now I'm going to do it and because, you know, he did it, and I'm going to do it and it just keeps repeating itself so that they don't know why they're doing it. Abraham knew why he was doing it, to, to worship the Lord and he knew the Lord was real because he had spoken to him on many occasions and helped him and told him that how he was going to be blessed. And I'm sure Abraham told Isaac these things. Sarah even told Isaac these things too, probably. And so Isaac grows up and he knows these things. Then he has his own relationship with the Lord. And then the Lord speaks to him. And then he, you know, sets up things and worships the Lord because the Lord is real to him. And so now Jacob is getting this and the Lord is being made real to him. The third generation here. And he is repeating this not simply because his grandfather or his dad did it. Like many religious institutions will do, they're just carrying on the family, you know, thing just because, just because, you know, he's actually have a reason, his own personal conviction of why he's creating this altar. And he even gets the revelation that this is the house of God. He's basically saying, this is church. This is where church is going to take place. God is coming down and visiting us. And this is the main place that he does it. Wherever church is, and wherever church is, two or more will be gathered in the name of Jesus. That name, the only name under heaven from which men can be saved. So this is an awesome connection from the Old to New Testament. And this is an awesome connection just, you know, worldwide about how Jesus Christ can come. And nobody can really control this. Communist governments and, 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 and governments who hate God have tried. They have stamped out people. They have marchered people and killed them. And people, there are evil people in the states that are trying to outlaw Christianity and ban this word. And ban this pow these powerful truths and principles that are built into creation already. They can't do it. They won't be able to do it. There's even those on social media and on platforms that try to lessen and try to downplay the power of the truth of the Bible and the Word of God. This is not mere religion, friend. This is a lifestyle. This, God is the creator of everything. He is the fundamental source of life. He is the reason our hearts can beat. He is the reason that we can breathe. And Jacob got a revelation of this in an instant as he's seeing all this. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone and rest, that he rested his head against, and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. See, so he's making pillars, like I mentioned, just like his father and just like his grandfather, but not simply because of mere religion and mere tradition. Oh, my dad did it. My grandfather did it, so I'm going to do it. No, he actually has conviction of why he's doing it, so it means something to him, and it is very, very real to him. So he's not just doing it because his dad told him. He's not just doing it because his grandfather told him. 
He's doing it because it's something real, okay? So that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. He named that place Bethel, which means the house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if, I will provide, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. So he is speaking in faith, basically, about what the Lord's going to do for him. I mean, he's already seen the Lord, right? But even after that, he's just, he's, he's kind of pumping himself up here using the words of his mouth. The very essence and energy God is giving him, he is using it to increase his faith even further. And he's letting him know, oh Lord God, and he's praying to the Lord, Lord God, if you could please do these things for me. I don't ask much, but if you could please do this, oh my God, I'll, I'll be so grateful to you and I know that you're with me. You know what I'm saying? And quite honestly, that's my prayer. <laughs> I don't know if that's your prayer, but I know that is my prayer, especially during this time of COVID-19 where you got jobs laying folks off because of COVID-19. I know it's not the employer's fault. They're doing what they got to do, man. They're doing what they got to do. You cannot hate your employer now. That's not what I'm doing. But because of COVID-19, people laying folks off and you, you make it do with what you can and I know the Lord sees this and he understands the situation and God has already formulated a plan. But that's one of my prayers. Definitely, Lord God, just give me enough so I can take care of myself. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and then and that is just a wonderful thing. So we continue on here with the last verse. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place of worshiping God and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, check this out. So not only is he talking about church, not only is he talking about the house of God, where two or three or more are gathered, he is in the midst and you can feel his tangible presence of the Lord, of the Holy Ghost, in the house where people are gathered, in God's house where people are gathered under his name, he says he will give a tenth of all he has to the Lord. That is a tithe. That is the first fruits of your income. So this little stimulus check that we got, if you got one, you got $1,200 per person. That's $120 that has to go to the Lord. You know that, right? I hope you guys know that. I hope you guys aren't saying, oh, because it's COVID-19, I'm going to just use all this for me. No, you still got to give God his 10%. I mean, if y'all Christians out there, y'all know this already. Of course, there's the sinners that probably know nothing about this. But hey, this is unlocking the key to always having financial prosperity, even when you don't feel like it. And it's more than just finances. It goes to your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health, your, um, um, your attitude, uh, your well-being your mindset, uh, your faith, your, uh, not just yours, but it extends to you and your household. So your wife, your children, you know, uh, you know it, it's just crazy. You know what I mean? That's why it's important that the man, the head of the house, grasps this. And he's living right and he grasps these because these, these things will change your life. So y'all tithe. Y'all give 10% of y'all income to your local church somehow. And tithe is something that you're supposed to do. Offering besides, that's something different. If you, want an, if you want to offer, that can be any amount that the Lord puts on your heart to give. But tithe is definitely something that means tenth in Hebrew. It's a tenth of all you have. Like I said, and I've said this before in my other videos, I've shared this. If you make $2,000 a month, that's $200. If you make $5,000 a month, that's $500 goes to the Lord. Your stimulus check was $1,200, right? $1,200, you give $120 to the Lord. It's not hard math. That's the cool thing about it because Lord knows I'm not good with math, okay? So this is one of my favorite chapters and I'm very excited and it's also short too. And so my God, this is just gets me excited about the things of God. I hope you guys are feeling this too. Man, may heaven smile upon you. May God bless you. We're going to move over to the prayer phase. You might say, John Mark, Lord, I, you know what? I, you, you're talking about these things and I have never viewed it this way. No one ever told me this before. And you'd be right because nobody's going to be teaching you these principles. Nobody's going to be telling you this unless you have a kind friend who's a Christian, like me, I guess. If you don't know any kind friends who are Christians, you got one right here, okay? <laughs> John Mark W., okay, trying to help y'all out. 
you got a kind Christian friend here telling you, or maybe you had another one try to tell you, but you pushed him off, you brushed him away, you didn't want to hear what he had to say because you thought he was trying to ram something down your throat. And most people will dismiss people like that, but, but you shouldn't because sometimes they do have, usually all the time, they have a great thing to say. Not every Christian's delivery is going to be the same. Some will be brash and bold about telling you. Others will tell you on a more one-to-one -one level. Some have to preach it to you. Some will be shy, actually, to tell you. And different Christians, different. there's different type of people in the, in the, in the house of God, different type of people all over the world. Uh, that are Christians, and they, they tell people in different ways, but they usually tell them the same thing, and it's always the same. The Lord can help you, and He can ri richly bless your life. I know for some, especially on the outside, that might sound cliche, and it might sound like those guys who go door-to-door. -door. Don't get us confused with the Mormons, okay? I do not have an elder name tag. I do not wear a white shirt with a black tie, and I have black pants, and I'm riding a bike or something like that. I do not have the Book of Mormon. I am not a Mormon. The Christianity and the, the Book of Mormon are two different things. And even though it says that, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Latter-day Saints or, you know, Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints or whatever, the weird stuff, that that's totally had nothing to do with biblical Christianity, okay? So don't get that mixed up, okay? But you might say, you know what, John Mark, I, I don't understand what you're saying, and but I know I need to get my heart right, and I want to have these benefits. And not only the benefits, I want to just get my heart right because Jesus Christ loved me, and I see he's the only one who can save me. He's the only one who died on the cross. That's what gives him the power and the authority to say what he says and so he can do what he can do with us, for us and to make our lives so much better than they are without him. And if that's you and you say, I need him to take away my wrong, evil, dirty sin, this stuff that I've been doing, this, this, you know, you know, I tried to get rid of the drinking, the alcohol, uh, I tried to fill this gap inside of me with lust, with girlfriends, with boyfriends, with, um, with owning things, making a lot of money, uh, uh, collecting things, uh, video games, entertainment, movies, uh, oh, you name it, cars, you name it, you fill in the blank. You've, you've tried to fill the gap inside of your heart with things of this world and you realize it ain't cutting it and you need something more. It's Jesus Christ is what you need. He created us and we were born in sin because of what Adam and Eve did back in the day. We are born in sin. All of us are born sinners. Yes, myself included. The difference between me and you, my friend, who is wanting to get Jesus Christ in your heart right now is that I have got Jesus Christ in my heart and I've acknowledged my sin and I understood that I needed to be forgiven and he was the only one who could forgive me. So you can do that too right now, my friend, listening. So we are going to go ahead and we're going to pray right now, okay? So just pray with me. Bow your head and close your eyes in respect to God. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. And I'm asking that you come inside of my heart, get rid of all my sin, make me clean, whole, and pure, mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. In the name of Jesus, by your precious blood, we pray. Amen. You, my friend, are now saved and blood washed. And it, in the Bible, it says these angels that was ascending and ascending down Jacob's ladder when Jacob saw him, every single one of those angels rejoices when one person gets their heart right with Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful thing, but you got to keep it going. Not only is it your responsibility, but it's, uh, you know, the people around you's responsibility. And so with that being said, you got to find a spirit filled church to go to. And I know it's during COVID-19. These things are going to be lifted soon. I believe May 31st, these things are going to be lifted soon. And you'll be able to go back to churches again. And I know the churches are probably going to be full, <laughs> a lot fuller than normal because, you know, sheesh. Hopefully more people go and they get their hearts right in real spirit-filled churches where they believe in all the spiritual gifts and um, demonstrate and proclaim this word as they did in biblical times. And they're doing it now. And that's where you got to go. And some of you, you got to go home. You're going to have to get rid of that, that booze, that vice, that something that you've been addicted to. You, you can't do that stuff anymore. You, 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 you may uh, go home and you find it hard for you to curse if you were a cursor. And if you curse like a sailor, you may find it hard to do that now because you are 
are clean. You know, I, I have there's many testimonies where I've met people where that's where that happened to them. They tried to curse. They just couldn't. Their their conscience wouldn't let them. Their conscience is now clean. The Lord has blood washed them inside and out. And they are new creatures. They're still them, but they are a new them, meaning you're clearly something that has not been created before, but yet you are still you. It's an awesome thing. My next thing is the backsliders. You guys know who you are. You guys know what you need to do. Get your hearts right with God. Come back to him. He is always with you. You can't get him out of your mind and your thought processes. You try. You try to drink him away. There's something that happened that caused you to turn away, whether it was you yourself, maybe somebody else in the church. Come on. You can rise above that and get your heart right. Forgive that person. And even if you don't want to go to that same church again, it would kind of be highly advisable that you would go back to the church where you first got your heart right in, but at least go back there to forgive that person and then look for another place to worship where, you know, the spirit of the Lord comes down just like it did in this particular spot that we read about in Jacob's um, place that he was at. And then we got Christians. You need to get your heart right. You probably, you guys have already done that. Please get your heart right. Right now, if you got a, something you need to get right with the Lord, get that thing right. And go ahead and forgive who you need to forgive and do what you need to do. Um, now we're going to move into the prayer phase. Anybody uh, for sickness. So if anybody has something wrong, whether it's COVID-19, AIDS, hangnail, cancer, you name it. God can heal all that. All right, uh, everybody that I talk to, you guys now are filled with faith. You have the faith to pray for yourself or others who are sick. You can stand in for people who are not listening to this right now. Or you can pray for yourself if you got a problem. Okay? You know what the problem is? You put your hand there. If you cannot put your hand there, you believe and you believe God is going to touch that and heal that thing right now. Whatever it is, let's pray together. We thank you, Lord God, for your love and kindness. We give you the praise and the adoration. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing, for how you're going to touch each and every one of these people, no matter where they're at. There is no distance in prayer. There is no time in prayer Lord God, wherever these people are under the sound of my voice, you're going to touch them. You're going to heal them. You're going to help them. In Jesus' name, amen. And some of you guys are going to have to go to the doctor and get stuff checked. They're going to have to run tests on you to see if you are fully healed and you have um, your cancer or whatever. That deep issue is gone or not. So be sure you go to the doctor and have them check on you to see what God did. There's some you already feel yourself is healed. You're already checking it. The pain is gone. That pain is gone. The arthritis is gone. That uh, uh, ache and that migraine headache is gone. Whatever it is. And if you guys have insomnia and you couldn't sleep, tonight you're going to get a real good sleep. You're going to get a real good sleep. Now, I understand a lot. So some people who ain't working, so you have a lot more energy than you normally would have. So that may be a contributing factor of why it may be hard to sleep. Well, that's okay. Just uh, do something in a day that makes you tired. You know, uh, I don't know. Do, do lots of push-ups. I don't know. Lift something heavy, you know. Uh, uh, read, read something, you know. Uh, read till you fall asleep. That'll get you to go to sleep. There's many ways to get to sleep, you know what I'm saying. So uh, focus on those ways. And then, uh, yeah, if, if insomnia isn't your issue. There's um, some people, you're going to have to get rid of that alcohol. You're going to have to get rid of that cigarette. You're going to have to go home and actually pour things out, throw things away that's been causing you to do things. There are those who may have been bound in witchcraft. You may have been into Ouija boards. You may have been into those type of things like that. You know, then you might have to get rid of that stuff. You may have to get rid of uh, some weird magic tarot cards. Maybe you own tarot cards. You Yes, tarot cards. That You know what tarot means? Death. You have death cards. You need to get rid of those things. Okay? Demons all over that stuff. They, they are attracted to those items. You need, need to get them items outside of your house. Throw that stuff away. Burn it. You have old grimoires and these weird tomes that are basically the opposite of what the Bible is. Get rid of those things. Okay? Shoot. I'm telling you. There's some people, you know what you got to do and you got to get rid of those things. Once you get rid of those things, you will feel the healing. You will feel the peace of God. You will feel it. And I know for some of you, you grab strong ties to these. It's not going to be easy. 
it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to, it may be hard for you to get rid of it, but you've got to really get rid of it and part ways with that so you can live this new life with Christ. My brothers, my sisters, friends, family, all those people everywhere all over the world, thank you so much for tuning in. Like and subscribe if this helps you. Leave me a comment below if the Lord has touched you and changed your life. I so appreciate you listening. That is all for this video. Until next time, may God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Thank you very much.